Today I'm going to be sharing some colored pencil tips to make your colored pencil work look more realistic. If you're interested in where I've been for the last week, check out the end of the video where I will be showing you what I did to this part of my yard. It's kind of scary right now. If you are a member over on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got about five hours or nearly five hours of footage for this tutorial. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon, for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. I have a new one every single week, except when I take a week off because of Texas storms. That's a whole other story. I've got over 200 videos for you to start watching immediately as soon as you sign up. The link for that is in the video description. If you want to see what videos I do have available, you can head over to my Patreon video library and see what all is there. I am working on Canson Me Tens here and I've already put in several layers of black, like several, so many layers of black pencil and then I'm blending that out with odorless mineral spirits. Now when you work on a dark toned paper like this, when you use the odorless mineral spirits, when you're blending it out, it will make things, as you can see here, look really, really dark. When it dries, it's going to lighten up and that's something that you're gonna see throughout this piece. So I blocked in many colors, many times I'm layering through, got my black background on that. Once that was done, I started on my flowers. Now, when you paint or draw flowers, you want to look at them as abstract shapes. If I look at this as I'm drawing a flower, my brain tries to take over and it doesn't look like a, it, it, I mean, it kind of would look like a flower, but not as much, it, it won't look good. It's not cute. You want to look at the abstract shapes. Where are your lights and where are your darks in your reference photo? And for this piece, the main focus is the lighting. I want really high contrast between those lights and darks. And on the flower, as I was working on it, I'm not thinking I'm drawing a flower. You wanna get that idea out of your head. You wanna really focus on your reference photo. Where are my lights, where are my darks, and what are those shapes there? Try copying the shapes that you see. Now with colored pencil, everything is a layering process. And that's the next tip I have for you. Kind of get out of your head this idea of just put the right color in the right place. That normally is not how most, most colored pencil artists are going to work. Look how I layer the blue over the pinks. And then I come back through with some orange on the areas that need to have that bit of a glow, that fat glow on the inside of the flower. Everything is about layering. And I'm using odorless mineral spirits, which is a type of paint thinner to blend out my all, all of the pencil work here. Now, in order for the odorless mineral spirits to work well, I have to have a lot of pigment on that paper. The biggest problem that people have or the biggest complaint people have when they don't get the results they want when working with odorless mineral spirits is that they didn't have enough pigment on the paper. That's usually the thing that went wrong. They just didn't have enough pencil there for the OMS to do anything with. This is not a watercolor pencil or it's not going to behave like a watercolor pencil when you add water to it or just a little bit of water and the, the, the pigment spreads everywhere. That is not how it works with colored pencil. You need a lot of pigment on that paper before you blend with the odorless mineral spirits. The next thing that you'll notice here, as I blend out, it'll look a little bit dull, a little bit chalky. That's completely normal on your first few layers. I'm going to just need to layer on top of layer on top of layer until I get that color saturation where I need it to be. Now my next tip is to not push very hard with your pencils in the earlier layers. When you push hard, we call that burnishing. And what you're doing is jamming the pencil into the paper, you're flattening the tooth of the paper. Now that can get you really bold color, but it also is going to prevent you from putting very many layers on top later. So we want to use a light hand. I'm generally working in small little circles and ovals as I build this up. And because I'm working in the light hand, I'm able to get multiple layers. I mean, I've probably got 20 layers at least on any given area of those flowers. So starting to block in the barbed wire, just to get an idea of where that is going to go and then blocking in them off. Now the flowers aren't finished. One of the things that I found when working on this paper specifically, more so than some of the other cans and tents that I've worked on, for some reason it seemed, and maybe it was just the temperatures outside, it was freezing at the time I drew this, but I mean, I was inside, but still. So the, the OMS took forever to dry. When I would blend out the background, I had a good half hour and it was still wet. That is not normal when I work on like a hot press watercolor paper with the OMS. So I really had to let areas dry for a very long time. Time. You do not want to work your pencil back over an area that is still even slightly wet from the OMS. You will damage the tooth of your paper. You could potentially put a hole right through that paper because the paper is soft and weak from being wet. You want to let that dry all the way. 
So that's why I'm going back and forth between the mop and then the flowers and the mop and the flowers letting one area dry while I work on another. Now this is Touch of Texture mixed with Titanium White. This is from brushandpencil.com. This product is the only product that is going to be archival painting it over your, your colored pencil work. A lot of people think they can just use either white gel pens or white ink or white acrylic paint. I don't recommend that. That is not going to be archival and that will end up chipping or rubbing off over time because you're working with wax and oil-based pencils. Now let's say you were working with a watercolor pencil. Go ahead and use your acrylics. No problem there are white gel pen. No problem. But when we're on these wax and oil based pencils, we don't want to paint a water based pencil on top of that because those don't mix. You know, remember our old science classes. So that product is a must have for me. I get that from brushandpencil.com. I think Dick Blick also carries it, and there are multiple stores that carry it in different countries. But that is the product that you'll see me painting these white highlights on. I have a video showing you exactly how to use that product. I will have a link to that in the description or a card pop up so you can check that out. So moving on to the giraffe, I've been blocking in a lot of blues. Notice the blues where the white is. We look at a giraffe and see that cream color and think cream or white, but that's in shadow. So in here, in the, the reference what I was using, it was a darker gray, but here I want to pull those blues and purples out for all of the areas that are in shadow on the cream portions of the giraffe. And then of course using a cream pencil here for the really bright, bold areas where the light is hitting. The main focus for me on this piece was getting that high contrast. My dark's really dark, my light's really light. And that's going to be one of the things that will make the biggest difference in your work looking realistic. Do not focus too much or be too worried about picking the perfect color. I need, if I just knew the perfect pencil color for the shadows, if I knew the perfect color, it really isn't about that. It's about your values. If your darks are dark enough and your lights are light enough, it will look realistic. There was no blue in my reference photo, none at all. So looking here, look how much blue I've got though, and I'm gonna even put more more than that. Lots of blues, lots of purples in those shadows. But the reason that it still looks realistic, even though it's blue, is that my values are correct. Get that high contrast. Your work will look so much realistic, so much more realistic, I should say, if you can really focus on getting correct values. And of course, choosing a reference photo that has strong contrast, that's going to make your work look even more interesting anyway. This was a photograph I took myself and then I edited it in Lightroom in order to make the contrast between the lights and the darks even more bold. Now for the cream areas here on his face, I've got to make those a little bit darker than what I want that end result to be just so that when I come on top with the, the white pencil to start creating the look of fur, it will show up over the dark areas. I want to make sure I've got both dark and light areas showing. So we're moving on to portions of the neck, starting to get some of the texture in there for the fur. Now, big tip for you, if you're painting a animal that has really, really short fur, do not try to force in a ton of marks of fur. It will make the animal look fluffy where it shouldn't be. So let's use one of my greyhounds, for example. One of them has extremely short fur. Most of the paint, if I paint him, most of it is going to be just where my general lights and darks are going to be, not little hair marks. You will have areas of the subject, especially around the face, maybe a little bit around the ears, a little bit on the, the front of the neck, where you may have a few more areas or few, like a little bit more definition on those, those hair marks, but don't try to force lines for fur just because you know animals have fur. Don't force those in there where that's not something that you would really see so defined on a short animal or short furred animal. And I'm going to create more of the definition of the fur around his face where it is a little bit longer, but you really want to be careful not to overdo it. You want to give the hint of the look of fur without trying to draw in every individual strand because you start changing the, the fur doesn't look the same anymore. It starts looking very coarse, a little bit too long. Although a long hair giraffe would be adorable, that's not what we want to create here. So still focusing on those values. And I will come back and rework areas of the neck so many times. And look how light that gets after I've blended with OMS, how it, it really lightens back up a lot. So when you blend with OMS on the darker paper like this, don't panic thinking, oh my gosh, it went super, super dark. I just ruined it. No, just let it dry. It, it'll come back up and look kind of chalky until you get multiple layers back over it. So while that dries, moving down here and working on the flower or the shadows under the flowers a bit, want to make those stand out more. 
So if an area, like in this case, the flower on the bottom there, I wanted those brights to appear even brighter. If an area of your work doesn't look bright enough, even though you've used as bright as you can go, make the, the zone next to it even darker, and that will make your brights look that much brighter. Notice that the color that I'm using for the highlights on the black of his horns there, it's the exact same blue, the exact same value as the shadow of the lighter cream white areas of his neck. So adding in some detail around the eye. Now we're starting to get a little bit more of the look of fur. And again, we just wanna create the hint. Don't try to put in every single strand or he's gonna look really weird you know, weirder than hollyhocks, mops, and wrapped in barbed wire. Maybe I shouldn't judge. See how I'm, I'm changing the direction of the fur there too. Really look at your reference photo and try to choose reference photos where you can see the information so you're not just guessing where the fur should change directions, but look how it changes there. If you were to draw a few brush strokes with fur or pencil strokes with fur and realize, wow, that looks just like fur, it looks great. Don't just keep repeating that same pencil stroke. You'll end up making the, the subject look flat. Look at the reference photo where the fur twists and turns. That's very, very important because that's part of what is, is defining the underlying bone and muscular structure. Really pay attention to where that fur twists and turns. So same thing here, You're starting to block in some of the bits of fur. Now the fur is a bit longer there, so I do have longer pencil strokes. I'm using a lot of magentas, blues, purples. I had most of my pencils, I think, pulled out for this piece. Everything except yellow. Now here's a tip for you when you're drawing most animals with the, ex the exception of some frogs, fish, birds. Besides that, if it's an animal that has fur, you're probably not going to use yellow at all. Just put those pencils away. We often think like yellow lab, use yellow, or blonde hair, use, use yellow. No, it will not look good. Usually in those cases, you're gonna be using more tans, grays, purples, magentas. Those are the colors you're typically gonna go with. Yellow, the only time you're really gonna see yellow on fur is either if the animal got into your yellow paint, looking at you there, Wade, a few months back, got into a tube of yellow paint of mine and was wearing that, or if there is a yellow reflection cast on the subject. And even then, I don't know how much I would include that in the painting, it'll look a little bit weird. So yellow is one of those colors that you're probably not going to use as much as you might think on an animal with that light buff colored fur. Well, I often talk about the importance of values over color. That's one of those colors I usually leave out. If you're doing something that's more pop art than, or, or impressionistic, then you can pull in some strokes of yellow, but it's not because the, yellow, the fur is supposed to be yellow in that, even in that case. And on the face of the giraffe, I'm doing the same thing that I did on the flowers. I'm not looking at it as, I'm drawing a giraffe. This looks like a giraffe all the way through. I'm sitting pretty close to this piece. So what I'm focusing on is not the giraffe as a whole. That's too big, it's too much. It's gonna be very overwhelming. Break it up into one little section. I'm focusing on one area at a time. So it may be the area around his eye or the area in the front of his nose. Just really zoom in and focus on that. Now this piece took me weeks to finish. You're looking at what, 15 minutes of footage to get to the end result, but that that is very deceiving. It took weeks. This is not something you're gonna sit down and try to get done in a night or two. You're not gonna be happy with the results if you make that attempt. Plan when you're doing something like this that's very elaborate, that has a lot of detail, it is going to take a lot of time. So definitely be aware of that. Here I'm using that touch-up texture, titanium white mixture, again, to pull out some highlights. Now the great thing with this product too, it adds a little bit more tooth to the paper. So if I paint something white, but I really wanted a light yellow, I just let this dry and I go over it with the light yellow. Now I've got, I'm working up against the white so that yellow is gonna show up really well. And it's also added a bit of tooth to the paper so the pencil will stick to it really well. And when I go over it with a pencil, I'm usually not pushing super hard. I'm not trying to chip that off the paper, but it is wonderful where you have an area, let's say I wanted light pink. Put this down first and then put the pink over it and it'll stand out even if it's on top of a darker color. I sound like a walking advertisement for that product because it's one of the, of, in all the years of new products that's come out, that is the one I can't do without. I would not want to go back to working in colored pencil without that product. 
really brightening up the orange. See how I just put orange right over the touch-up texture titanium white, and now it's this nice bold orange where if I tried to do that over the browns that I previously had, it wasn't going to stand out. And when you use that product too, make sure you let it dry completely. At least 10 minutes, a half an hour would be better. Like really let it dry before you go over your colored pencil. It needs to not just be dry to the touch, but really cured so it attaches well and doesn't chip off on you. Back to some details on the moth. And when you've got a lot of areas like this that are technically very, very small, I am not going to get nearly as much detail into those as I would if I just did a very large painting. Let's say I did the same size with one moth. That moth is now big. I have room to get all the tiny, tiny details. When I'm working with something like this, where the subjects are, or the different elements are very tiny, I'm really focusing more on my general lights and darks than I am the tiny detail. I'm not going to worry about that detail. Or let's say I'm painting something where there's a wolf in the distance or, or something along those lines. I'm not focused on trying to make that, get every detail around the wolf's eyes. You're not gonna see it, he's off in the distance. If you were to see him in nature, you're not gonna notice that kind of detail. So I'm not gonna try to, fo fo I can't talk, force detail into something that is on the smaller side. In that case, I'm going, or off in the distance, I'm going to focus on my general lights and darks to get the look that I'm going for there. If I wanted tons of detail, I would be much better off working way, way larger. And there is our finished painting. If you are interested in following along with this where most of it is in real time or barely sped up, make sure to check out Patreon. It is over there. I've got almost five hours of footage for this painting. So one of the things that I found to be kind of interesting on this one, and I really didn't expect it, was the response that a lot of people had to the barbed wire concept of this. There was no deep meaning in me including barbed wire other than I think it's very interesting to look at, the shape, I think it's very pretty. If anything, to me, barbed wire symbolizes safety. You're, you're kind of protected from that outside world by that barbed wire. So I'm, I was interested in how many people commented that they had a negative or like a more emotional response to that barbed wire as though the barbed wire was hurting the giraffe. My, when I created it, that wasn't even remotely like in my head there. I really didn't have much meaning behind the barbed wire in the first place other than it being interesting to look at. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Let me know, what is your response to the barbed wire? What is it, does it symbolize something to you very different than how it did to me? Also let me know, have you painted or drawn something where you had a somewhat unexpected reaction when people saw it? I would love to know your, or hear your stories. So after last week's drama with the storm, I was it, it was a stressful week of power on, power off, water sometimes, no water, don't drink the water. It was a whole thing of just so stressed. So I decided that a lot of the yard work that I've, I've needed to do, I was going to go ahead and take one more week off and just work outside. Let me tell you, that physical work will take away all the mental stress because my body hurt so bad between the sunburn I gave myself because I... For some reason, my brain was like, it was snowing last week. I don't need sunblock. Yeah, no, I got one of the worst burns of my life. That hurt. Um, I'm finally healed from that. But I decided to go ahead and start on this. The, this is the main project here. This was the flower bed that I wanted to put in front of my studio window. That is this, the bay window there for the studio. So I had to remove most of that grass there. Now, I'm not removing the roots. I'm always going to be fighting with the, the Bermuda grass wanting to come through that. So there it was, and I had to remove most of that with a pickaxe. Here in Texas, between the rocks and the clay, shovels don't do a whole lot of good. There are my ornamental grasses I'm going to plant. So once I got all of that removed, I went ahead and started putting down the weed barrier. That was a lot of work. Here you can see it's kind of flowing in the wind. It still needs all of the staples to hold it into place. Then I went ahead and started putting down and planting the grasses here. Now I went with the Mexican feather grass for the back row because those will end up bigger than my lily turfs over the, the period of the next year. So those will come up higher. If you're thinking, why would you put those down? Because they're smaller now. They'll end up being bigger throughout all of this. So there we go, got them all placed out. And then I had to just cut the hole and then dig the, the spot for them to go. There they are in the ground now. My next step was to put all the lily turf, turf lily, lily turf, I always get that backwards, lil, lil, lyriope, lyriope, I don't know how to say any of the words, but that is variegated lily turf there. Got those put into the ground. 
And this was the day when I was planting everything that I got so sunburned. It was sunburned. I can't talk. Sunburned. It, I had added an extra D there. But it was, oh my God, so much work. So I finally got all of that in. Then I was able to go through and do the staples around everything. There's Gibson helping. Thanks, Gibson. Super helpful. Actually, it was either between that or his face in where I was trying to work. Those were my options through this whole process. Once that was done, I went ahead and put down the mulch. That mulch was really wet from it having snowed at Lowe's um, before we bought it, and it was really heavy. Again, really good workout. My next step was to plant these shrubs into the ground. They had been in pots for the last year. They were overgrowing those pots, so time to put them into the ground. These guys take a pretty big hole. Here in Texas, we want to plant not too deep. We want more of a wide, shallow hole. But again, with the hole, you can't dig with a shovel here. Everything was done with a pickaxe. Oh my gosh, there's my bird feeder. The, the work it took to get those four holes, it was most of the day just trying to chip out. And it was wet. I mean, the, the ground was wet enough that it should have been easier. But because there's so many rocks, I was chipping through rocks more than even the clay. So that was a lot of work. Finally got those into the ground. And that was my third day of digging holes and working out here. So at this point, my muscles were just rubber, rubbery limp noodles. So I took those pots, stuck them over in between the large air, bare areas in between the ornamental grasses. And that I'm going to probably be putting sweet potato vine in those once the weather warms up a bit more. I've got a few weeks before I'm probably safe to go ahead and put those out. The cool thing about this flower bed is it is going to tie together two other areas of my yard. I've got three areas that will have the the sweet potato vine now. I've got Mexican feather grass in one other area. They're in pots. And this helps. I've got the lily turf that is in the flower bed in the back. This really is going to help to tie those zones in together. For me, when I do the landscaping, I wanted it to look kind of like how I do with the painting, where you want different elements that are sprinkled. Like if I use one color in one area, I have to use it in another area to balance everything out. And so that's really what I'm doing here. Some of that Mondo grass is not doing great. Three of them are, are quite questionable. So, and even that feather grass there might not make it, but luckily the place that I buy them from Callaway's has a lifetime guarantee on everything. So if one of those went into shock and doesn't make it, they'll replace it for me. So not a big deal there. I mean, obviously I don't want it to die, but it happens. So here, my tree in the background, I've got a cedar elm and the grass went right up to the tree or almost up to the tree, not quite. But I went ahead and put down the weed barrier and then the mulch on top of that to kill off the areas where the grass was. Hopefully that will die off so that next year, or the grass will have died off enough that next year I can go ahead and put sweet potato vine all around the tree. That's the plan. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, sweet potato vine is going to go into that pot that's sitting empty there. And day four was spent cleaning my patio. I washed all of the cushions. I put together the new water fountain you see back there. I got the table cleaned, the fire table. That was filthy. Everything was just dusty and dirty. I washed windows. I still need to put the generator away. We've got to do some maintenance on that and then put that guy away. So he's in the way. He doesn't look cute there. I reorganized where some of the plants were. And a lot of this stuff needs to be trimmed. The star jasmine is gonna to have to be trimmed down. It looks like some of it is still alive, so I do expect most of it to come back, which surprised me. There is the water fountain. I was so excited about this. I wanted it, this specific one. Don't mind the flip-flop. You have to pay extra for that. It does not, does not come installed. But I wanted that, that this exact waterfall last year, and they were just sold out everywhere. So this year, I went, when I was all stressed out from the snow, snow, I went ahead and decided to jump in before everyone else started doing their spring planning and got myself that waterfall. Now these little lights are going to end up around the flower bed. I have these in all all of the other flower beds as well in the backyard. These go on the ground, they're solar. They look so pretty. There is my yard from, or the back flower bed from last, I wanna say this was spring, so the, the crepe myrtles were just coming in or starting to leaf out at that point. But look at the ground there. Those lights are those solar lights. That's what's going to be in between some of the feather grasses and the lily turfs until those get full enough that you can't see them anymore. But in the meantime, those are gonna go there. I bought a couple of other things to put in that flower bed as well. Um, a really cool Alice in Wonderland themed sign, which I will show you guys once I get it. So excited about that one. And yeah, that is the yard. I am so proud of myself because I did all of this completely by myself. Everything from dragging the mulch into the backyard, digging up the grass, planting, digging the holes. Everything was done completely like 
I'm just so proud of myself. And I've had people ask why my husband or didn't your husband help? Why wouldn't he help? He would if I asked him to. I don't want him to. This is my project. I get to do everything exactly how I want. And if he's not involved, he's not going to give me his opinion on, well, I think you should do this plant or maybe you should do that plant or maybe you should move this over. I didn't want anyone's opinion. I wanted to do do what I wanted. And it was the best stress relief. Yeah, my body was physically like I thought I was going to die. There was a lot of ibuprofen in my life during those days. But this is something that I know I did by myself. And I'm just so, so, I guess tickled would be the word. How old do I sound when I say I'm tickled about something? But I'm so thrilled with this. There is the clean patio. Mine is still need to get the generator out of there with the lights. But it's a really nice space. I, I, I sit out there a lot. Last summer, I go out there a lot and sit out there with my coffee or wine in many cases. So yeah, there's my happy space. And this is what I've been working on for the last week and why I was MIA. But we'll be back to our normal schedule now that all of that work is done. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. Also, don't forget to click on the bell notification icon because otherwise YouTube probably won't notify you when a new video goes up.